Excellent. Okay. So we're going to call to order the Dining Commission on Human Rights at 6 30. So we're going to do a roll call. We do have most members on the site. We do have one member um, that's joining by Zoom. So we're going to do a full roll call. So after I say your name, if you could just say here, um, Danielle Musa. Here. Um, Chris Danielis. Here. Alice Sunart. Here. Kristen Pyers. You have to unzoom. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> and I'm Jill Harris, so we are all in attendance. Um, if you could all unmute and stand to the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> the Pledge of Allegiance to the Father, to the United States, to the Republic, to the United States, and the nation, under God, indivisible. Let me see if I can unmute the others. It's okay. Just leave it. Okay. You got it. Thank you. It's just for the button. Um, so we have to approve um, the minutes for the July meeting. So has everyone received the minutes? Do I need to do a full roll call for receiving the minutes? No, the minutes? just to uh, approve okay. uh, the minutes. Okay, does anybody have any changes they would like to add to the minutes? No. Okay, so we have to approve the minutes. So we will call. Um, we have to have somebody in motion to approve the minutes. I make a motion to approve the minutes. Thank you, Kristen. Does anybody second? Second. Second by communion. Um, so, um, do I have to go over the people that have already approved? Like, have that seconded in first? So, I want to do Kristen and yeah. Vinian again. I just have to do. Yeah, now you're going to ask for any discussion. Okay. Any discussion on the minutes? If not, then we can do a roll call of votes. And if we have anybody, about five minutes. Okay. Allie? Yeah, questions, and I do approve. Kristen? No question, I agree. Vinian? I approve. Kristen? I approve. I approve. Okay. So the second, um, the next act is to interview our candidate, which is Mormon, and he is gracious enough to join us here. So we're going to just go around and ask you a couple of questions, and then um, we can go from there. Does okay. anybody have any do you care to start and give us a little bit of information about yourself, or would you like us to just go into questions? I, I would just say in general one thing. I was born in this town and involved in a lot of activities, from youth sports to police association, wine club, and all that. And I thought if I could add something to your club, I mean, if uh, it doesn't seem to fit, I'm a lot older than everyone here. And, uh, but I hope my ideas can help you out. That's why I try to get on them. Join you guys. Okay. Um, Alan, do you like to ask any questions of mine? Sure. It's nice to meet you. I am very glad actually that we had the opportunity to meet in person. Um, a lot of our meetings have been on Zoom. Um, so in the event you do join the committee and we are doing Zoom meetings, if you need help, all of us can lend out a hand. Um, but I guess my main question for you is there are a lot of committees out there in the town. Um, some of them do have some vacancies, some of them don't. Um, I'm curious why specifically the Human Rights Committee? Well, because I <clears throat> see some of the things going on in school that I personally don't like. And I see there's a lot of changes in the town that I think I can bring the flavor of the people of this town that might help you understand some things. And that's why I wanted to get on the board. All right, thank you. And there, I've been on other committees, but, you know, uh, uh, I'm getting to an age where I moved away from those. So, you know, I was on the thankless finance committee on that place. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, as you need, you know, the select needed me, so I jumped on board with that. And uh, enjoyed the time there and everything. I was chairman of the playground commission. It used, it used to be called a playground commission. It's probably called the rec commission or something like that. Now, same thing. We uh, 
kind of upgraded a lot of things in town. And I am involved with a lot of coaching and sports, so that was important to me. And that's that's why I thought this might be a fit for me. Um, so when you think of the Human Rights Committee and, and what the committee do, does, and now I'm Brendan, this is the second meeting. <laughs> I was in your last meeting, so I was in your shoes in the last meeting. But I'm just curious what, what specifically do you feel like you can bring to the table as far as um, regarding human rights, whether you know, <coughs> what category of individuals or, or whatever that you feel that well, I think my job, I've been very fortunate. I have grandkids, and I told them that if you have a job like I've had in my life, it's not a job, it's a way of life. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to work with colleges and universities throughout New England. And I'm in the industry mostly has three years dominated by men. And the reason is because I call on engineers and facilities managers, even though there are women coming into the industry back when I started, it wasn't so. And I was always, of the, through my parents, I guess, I always said, hire the best person. I didn't care if you were male, female, black, white, whatever. I went for the best person. And so I built a reputation doing that. And uh, I have some personal friends throughout the industry. I know the woman who runs, ran the convention center in Boston and Heinz Auditorium is a personal friend. And when she wanted to move out of the politics, I hired her to work for my company. She's one of my best employees. So I've been involved with a lot of people, not only in New England, but we're a manufacturing rep. And we rep over 80 companies in the electrical industry. So that gives me the broad brush of the whole United States because they're all over the country in these factories. And I go to visit them. I learn what's going on there compared to what's going on in New England, Massachusetts, Dighton. So I've had a good career and I thought maybe some of those experiences could help. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Chris, for I feel like you know him <laughs> We had a little sidebar. <laughs> that that makes it hard for me now to pin you. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, so at the beginning, when you were uh, uh, introducing yourself, you, you have alluded to the fact that you you seeing some things that are happening in the schools, yeah, in the school systems that perhaps caught your attention, and you want to be part of the conversation. So say, there are a few things to say to perhaps for you maybe to address here. What are those things? Mm -hmm. right? That's the first. And then secondly, uh, in which specific ways could you help improve this in a way in which is congruent to the human rights commissions? Yeah. The Human Rights Committee's mission. Well, I'll give you my thoughts on it, okay? okay? When I have two boys, four grandkids, and one lives in Arkansas, you say, why they Well, my head was. The other one lives in Dutton. And my four grandkids are my life. And when my boys went to school, it was more simple. I always said the teachers might say things to you you disagree with. You listen to their point of view, you don't have to agree with them. And if it's way off, talk to me and we'll discuss it. Okay. So we got through all those years, never had a problem. Okay. Uh, now I have two grandkids here at the high school, one's a senior, one's a freshman. And I don't know about anyone else that knows any kids that had to go to school from home. That doesn't work. And these kids have too many outlets for things and they get distracted easily. But that's not the reason I'm concerned. The reason I'm concerned is because my oldest grandson, uh, he gets involved with things and he researches things. He so he doesn't take a yes or no answer. And I found that at the high school, a lot of the teachers try to push on their political views 
on to the students. I'm against that. I don't think that should happen. They should be teaching them. They might expose, but don't. I've had actually cases where somebody's written, I totally disagree with you. Well, don't stand back in someone because of their English abilities or whatever it is, math abilities, because they disagree with you. But I give my grandson credit because he's got the road on his own and he says he gets along with every single teacher at the school and they can try to kid about it. And he likes that. He said because he was talking about a social study teacher who politically he'll talk about one politician on one side today and make fun of it. The next day he's talking about another one. That's okay. And you can tell your opinion, but don't try to brainwash the kids into saying you're wrong. You are wrong. You've got to stop believing what I'm telling you. So I thought this committee would get involved with things like that if you saw something that was wrong and at the schools or the workplace or town or whatever. And then I'd like to get involved and see how you go about changing it or correcting it. That's, so that was my real interest. I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, yes, Thanks. I think that was a great answer, but I do want to encourage you more. Can you sit up here a little bit closer to the microphone? So, so they can hear you in the Zoom uh, audience. Dave was right. I said I was going to sit up here. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> I do feel like uh, the, the people who are viewing from home also would like to hear what you have to say. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, do you have a question? Or do you have a follow up question? So, um, we are obviously always trying to get more involved in the community. Is there anything that you can suggest for us to be able to um, reach out to the community and you know just make sure that you know we're doing we're doing our job as as human rights committee? Well, I think, um, let me give you a little example. I'll probably not talk too much for you. But no, 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 you can't. Okay. I, through one of my employees, uh, he wanted me to swap with him to be a big brother. I'm not sure where the big brother from. Yeah. So when I got talking, because I'm a talker, <laughs> I recommended him. He's a great guy, and he would try to do a good job. So the person interviewing me said, Well, how about you? Would you think of being a big brother? I said, no, I'm way too old. I could be a big grandfather, but not a big brother, you know? So they said, well, age is no barrier. And we had 8,000 kids in Boston waiting for big brothers. So how can I say no? So you know what I said to her on the phone? I said, well, I'll tell you what. She would get someone that might be interested in me, tell them my age, and that they're still interested, I'm in. And I figured, see you later, I'm going to get the big brother again. A week later, I got a call from someone in Somerset who wanted me to be that big brother. And I had a great relationship. His father was a pro athlete who was in jail on drugs. And him and I just hit off great. And he's 22 years old now. And when you're 18, you get out of the program. I was, because of him, not me, but because of him, they have a big fundraiser in Boston area, over 500 people and all these athletes from, you know, every sport you can think of show up that night. And I was on the front page of a magazine and everything, and it's all because of him. And I'm so glad I got involved with it. But you know what happened? I was able to, they want to hire me at Big Brothers to go around and speak in front of groups because they need help. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll do the job, but you're not paying me. And they said, what do you mean? I said, but you can fire me if I don't do a good job. If I volunteer, I'm a volunteer. But, and I did that for a while when John was, his name John Smith. And he was, uh, he's down in Florida now. He wants to be a paramedic. And I just visited him during the winter. I'm trying to get him into golf because I, he's a good athlete. And I play a lot of golf, so naturally I'm trying to get him into it. And uh, we still stay in touch. So. Is there anything specifically though that we can do in Zion um, for you know the community itself? Like as part of the Human Rights Committee, we're we're constantly just trying to make sure that we're we're doing we're being active members of the community and that we're trying to really fulfill our mission, um, which is inclusivity and. Quality for everyone. 
So we're trying to always think of like different community events that we can do, et cetera. So is there anything that you can think of um, from, you know, you have so much experience around the world and uh, you know, in this town specifically. So is there anything that you can think of that we, we could possibly do to engage? Well, like I said, because we age, I have a ton of friends in this town. Mm -hmm. it is, it's amazing that coming to this room, they age the only one I know. <laughs> and that's not wrong style. I mean, my grandkids said, Papa, you know everyone in town. I said, well, I was born here, and there's only less than 7,000 people in this town. So yeah, I know most people or their family. The thing I would say you can bring to the town mm -hmm. is to make you feel involved. And that's why I think I can help out. Because nothing wrong with being young, enthusiastic, and all the things you people are doing here. I think it's great. And, but I think I can bring an uh, older viewer. I think some people would have maybe attacked themselves to that saying, well, not that I'm a special guy, but it's all along. Old norms enjoying their company, maybe they're doing the right thing. And then maybe I can get some input and see what bothers them. And I'll tell you the truth. You've got to look at the town of Dyke and what you do. And I had. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know how you get control the cameras. <laughs> but I, I had some differences, and I tried to iron them out. I had someone in the fucking board want to get through anything possible. That's wrong. Okay. You should be open to communication mm -hmm. and listen to people's views. And that's what I think you people are trying to do. So everyone has input and, and expresses their human rights. So I think it's helpful. Kristen, do you have any um, questions for Mark? Hi, sorry. I, I just, I don't know what, uh, just to address the camera situation, I'm not sure if you know what's happening. Like it keeps zooming away from you guys and over to the gentleman sitting at the desk. So- Oh, you can't see me? I, I can see half of you. Well, okay, I'm start. 23 years old. I don't <laughs> know <what I> <laughs> You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to move from here so it doesn't pick up my sound at all. I'm wondering if that's what it's doing, right? Because yeah, it's... let's try that. Sorry, guys. Let me move over here. No, it's, you're getting a lot of attention. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I'm a lot younger than Dave. <laughs> no. So, hi, Norm. Thanks for coming in. Um, um, like you, I am a lifelong Daytonian. I've lived here pretty much my most of my entire life. My family's from this town um, on both sides of my family for many years. Um, so I don't really have um, a question for you. I just had a statement um, that I think it's actually great that you know that's what we want is more diversity and you know representation of different voices, different you know ages, different genders, different races, different everything. So I actually really value and appreciate the fact that, you know, you are interested and want to become a mm -hmm. member because I think that would definitely be a valuable uh, a piece, you know, um, to have to have the voice of all different people in town. So. Thanks. I agree with that statement. And the thing is, I, I, I'm talking about the old community, but I also see, I've been involved with youth sports and I'm a creative guy, nothing else, I'm all creative. It might not always be the best creation, but I always, uh, I'm the maverick of the industry, and I always come up with these ideas. And I'd like to see more young people, too, get involved with this. So if there's problems with the school of communications, that you've got to get these students involved. I was, I'm bragging about my grandson, but like in his freshman year, he was the president of the class, and he came home and his mother said, oh, who won the election? He goes, oh, I did. He said, I feel pretty bad. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, I won by like 70 or 80 percent. And the kid that was running into the nice kid. And he did it for a year. But guess what? They didn't give him anything to do. I got some mad at him because he quit. They said, oh, you're going to be president next year? He's not like a lot of students have become president of class offices. What are they doing? They're building their resume. They really don't care about you know, running things. I'm not saying all, but I think you got to get them involved in youth. I know Dave's on the Lions Club and we have the Leos from the high school, and that's been a good input thing, and, you know, getting involved with them and uh, the physical things us old guys can't do anymore, the high school kids can't. So I like to see involvement of all ages. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
try to help with that. That is something that we have discussed a lot, um, you know, trying to get the units involved. So. Does everyone feel comfortable voting today? Yes. We got a, a motion. Um, I motion to induct Norman Corsi to our committee. I'll second. I'll second. Um, motion at 650. Seconded by Kristen. So I will do a roll call. Um, Kristen? Yes. Um, I have to keep that opinion. Yes. I'm going to have to keep this going. So Kristen? Yes. <laughs> Allie? Yes. And then I also say yes. So I will do a resign. Um, um, why can I not do the work? You're going to send a letter to the board. I'm going to send a letter to the board. <laughs> <laughs> a recommendation letter. That's what it is. <laughs> so I'm going to send a recommendation letter to the board tomorrow, um, and then they'll approve it at the next board of select meeting, and then you can get sworn in after that and join our committee. Well, thank you. Thank you so I much. I look forward to working with everyone. I, I think you have, I filled out a, a resume that went yep. to so I, I guess you've got that. Yes, cool. we have okay. that. Yep. Well, thank you very much. I explained that uh, I would like to sit here and listen to the meeting. Don't take me as the guy that wants me on a committee and then run out the door. Okay? <laughs> but I am going to on the cake tonight. So I'd rather say thank you, thank you, thank you, and then drive down the cake. Is that okay? Of course. You don't have to Thank you. All right, and I look forward to working with everyone, get to know everyone too. So thank That's you. That's true. We took thank you, Norman, for this day of yeah. every month. Um, so we can, we'll let you know what awesome. what you we're going to be doing. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you know, we have to be strategic on what we're going to do with these funds. Um, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll find a good solution to, you know, find a way that we can connect with the community appropriately. So we just have a maybe we'll have more questions soon. So we're going to turn it over to Vinian, he's going to start our discussion on wellness. Do you need to share your screen? You can only come out. And just want to make sure they can hear. Okay. Uh, yeah, you, you, if it doesn't work, maybe you can sit like in the center if you don't want to do that. Sorry about no, that. Can, can, can you guys hear me on that? Kristen, can you hear them? Kristen. Go ahead, speak. Let me let, um, go ahead and talk. Let me see. It's just the echoiness of it is okay. kind of hard. Can you hear me? It's it, it, if you were a little closer, oh, I think it okay, might be. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> you can just sit next to Ali. You know, it's kind of in the middle. Very um, sensitive to noise, too. So, any other movements and things? <laughs> okay, so um, is it better now? So, I feel like this is, in fact, this meeting is a good place for all of us to try to define what exactly is this community doing, what, is, what does it mean to be human, what are these rights that we're talking about, and, and so on. Okay, so, so let, let, let me start by my best attempt at clarifying the way I see the mission of this community. And you can't really clarify that until we agree on the terms. What are, what, first of all, what does it mean to be a human being? That's the first thing. As far as I can see it, humanity is more or less an abstraction, which is representing a set of subjective experiences intrinsic to every individual. And that is not something that we can argue about. But then, by its very definition, a human being cannot live on its own, although the individual is sovereign, the individual, the individual is connected to the community. Family, then neighborhoods, and then cities, counties, states, continents, and from one continent to the other continent to reach the entire. And, and at every level, Right? We do not exist on our own. We are connected. And everything we do ripples ripple itself, right? Everything that we do will ripple itself throughout the fabric of society. So we have to agree on these terms. But then, every member has a certain set of rights. As clearly stated in our constitution and also by the United Nations. And those are axiomatic principles, meaning that we cannot argue what these rights are. So, now, whenever there is a right, there is a responsibility. And at every level of this connection, someone has to be responsible that the rights of every individual is being featured. So the way I see what this community is doing, this community is doing, is at the level of this town, which is a collection of individuals, we're here to make sure that every member of this community, regardless of their background, 
is being heard and that their rights will never be infringed upon, upon. Now, the United Nations has also given a certain list of vulnerable populations. And you can see the list right there, children, adolescents, women, and girls, persons with disabilities, migrants, refugees, LGBTQ, elderly, especially those with lower income and disabilities, and racial minority, depending on which country, because the definition of a racial minority varies from one uh, country to another. Okay. So, so these, for this next set of activities, we will focus on one of these groups. We want to talk about other one. I looked around a little bit, and there is no clearly threshold defined, clearly defined threshold for what it means to be an elderly in the United States, but at least in the state of Massachusetts, the main services are made available right about 65, 65 and over. And I also tried to look at the uh, US Census Bureau data and try to see, okay, how many do we have here? Uh, it looked like about 15% of the dying population uh, is 65 and over, and about half women, about half men, women slightly, uh, the population of women, women is slightly larger. Now, what are these rights that we, and these are not coming from us or me, these are rights which were outlined by the United Nations. Independence is one of them. Participation, care, self-fulfillment, dignity. These are their rights, which makes all of those our responsibilities. Now, I'm not a specialist in this, so I, there are many questions that I have that I hope this committee will help answer. So, for example, how are we doing? How is this community doing? You know, with these principles. Is there, can we in fact measure, is there a way to measure how we are doing in upholding those responsibilities? Um, we have to make sure that there's structures in place available to this population, and we have to make resources available to uh, you know. I have had a hard time actually finding accessible information. There are a lot of information on the web, of course, but the first thing is overwhelming and too technical, right? So I'm assuming that if someone is in that population, they need to have a straightforward place where they can get all of this, this information. Um, I'm going to transition, like I said, I'm not a specialist. I'm going to transition and pass the baton to someone who knows a little bit more about, about uh, the needs and the resources available for this. All right, I think so. I'm going to do my best here with this. Uh, thank you, Minion. That was interesting. Um, so, you know, we decided that our topic was going to be, you know, August is basically wellness month um, and how, you know, everyone is entitled to some level of wellness. Um, and for me, one of the populations that I tend to see often sometimes that go underrepresented or undersupported are the seniors um, in the elderly community, not just in, you know, I'm not saying in Dighton, but in general. Um, I've worked in the skilled nursing and rehab facilities um, for over 20 years now as an occupational therapist. So seeing kind of firsthand, um, you know, experiences of what people have had to, what challenges that they've faced, um, and also just from different research that I've done. Um, so really, you know, 
the topic of senior and wellness is such a huge topic. I mean, it doesn't really, for me, just to talk for 10 minutes doesn't do it justice. Um, but what I was hoping to be able to do is just um, share some of the barriers that I've seen that research has shown, and then just offer to, um, to anyone who's listening and to you all, uh, some of the services that are offered in Dighton. Because I mean, for someone that's lived here all their life, um, there, I was embarrassed to say there were things that came up that I didn't even know about or realize. Um, so, you know, and if you know a senior living in town or if you have, you know, a family member, whoever, these are good resources that you can work with them. Um, so I am going to share my screen um, here and talk to these things. Bear with me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so as we age, a variety of changes occur and interact with each other, which can result in the elderly population being unable or have limited ability to achieve different aspects of wellness. You know, and there tends to be common themes through and through each of these different areas of wellness. Um, and I choose, chose just to look at nutrition, medical care, and socialization and physical. Um, so in some of the research that I did and some of the surveys that are out there, it shows that 20% of older adults report food insecurity, um, which means it could be their days without eating or having to take steps such as choosing not to fill prescriptions to avoid hunger. Um, and this could be due to a variety of issues. Some of the common themes that I come across um, is lack of transportation to access food sources. This could be to the grocery store or a food pantry or to the church. Um, that's really a big one, whether or not they can drive themselves or if they can get someone to give them a ride. Um, limited physical ability to perform tasks that could be such as walking around the store, being able to push a carriage. Do they use a walker and, or a cane? Um, being able to carry grocery bags. Do they have to go up and down stairs to get their groceries in and out? Um, or even go as far as putting the food away, being able to put it you know, on a shelf or, or do what have you. Um, cognitive impairment. You know, for some um, people, as we age, we start to develop cognitive impairments. And this could be as simple as not knowing how to prepare the food, um, when to eat it, or even if remembering if they did eat it or not, um, being able to manage their money to purchase groceries. Um, what else? Oh, changes in sensation, often, you know, lack of smell or taste. Um, or even, you know, the feeling of the food in their mouth, their ability to swallow their food, as well as their dentation. Um, you know, as we age, you know, our, obviously our teeth are changing. If we're not able to take good care of them, we're losing our teeth. Dentures aren't covered by insurance for most people. Um, so that can be a pretty significant cost. Um, and then also those that are either on a fixed income or have a low income. So you take that, you know, you have a very fixed income and, you know, by the time you're done paying your bills, your medication, um, your utilities, your insurance, what have you, there's always not a lot of money left to buy food. So, you know, they're buying what they can afford and not always necessarily buying what um, might be the best healthy choice because that's what they can afford at the time. Um, and then medical, um, again, transportation to and from appointments. Um, you know, will there be a cost associated with it? And what will that cost be if someone has to drive them? Will the transportation be reliable and timely? I happen to work in Rhode Island and we have a huge barrier right now with ambulance transportation. Um, sometimes these elderly folks are sitting outside in their wheelchairs for up to two hours. You may have even seen it on the news where this is actually this has happened because people are complaining about it. It's 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 unbelievable, um, you know. And these people are expected to wheel themselves in and out of doctor's appointments and offices because the transportation company isn't allowed to push them in and out of a doctor's office. Um, so, or if they drive themselves, what's the parking situation? Are they gonna to have to walk a long distance? Will they know where the building is? Is it well marked? Um, sometimes I have a hard time finding a medical building. 
um, the cost of medical procedures, medication co-pays. Oftentimes we see people that will only take a half um, or a lesser dose of their prescribed medication um, so they can make it last longer. Uh, I've seen my, you know, some of my own family members do that at one point. Um, or even goes is not purchasing the medication because it is too costly. Um, you know, I don't know a, a lot about it. I know, you know, with Medicare Part D, we have that, they have the donut hole where it goes so sky high. Um, so, or just not following through with recommended uh, medical procedures because of the costly co-pays. There's also high cost health insurance plans. And then we get to the world of technology. Um, you know, a lot of us now, you know, we're getting telehealth visits or making appointments online or checking, you know, different things online. A lot of the elderly population, I mean, I don't know about you, but a lot of the, the elderly in my family, um, you know, are, are unfamiliar with how to use those services. So unless you have someone or a good support system, you might not necessarily be able to access that, that service or that benefit. Um, and then from a socialization and physical standpoint, um, hold on here, uh, illnesses and disabilities. Um, so it can be physical limitations. It could include pain, weakness, shortness of breath, balance instabilities, low energy levels. Um, it could be cognitive impairments, including memory loss, word finding difficulty, or any type of speech deficit. Um, and then with that, a lot of people have anxieties around these illnesses. You know, they're afraid to fall. They're embarrassed that they can't communicate or engage in a conversation. Um, maybe they won't be able to manage the pain or whatever symptoms they might be having from, you know, the, the illness um, that they have. And hearing loss is also another huge one. Um, and again, insurances don't typically pay for hearing aids. There are some and they'll cover portions of it, but it's costly. Um, so oftentimes people become isolated because they can't hear what the conversation <coughs> is. So they become more withdrawn. Um, so, and then one of, um, wait a minute. So, and then just loneliness, isolation, depression, um, you know, as, as we age, you're losing friends, um, whether it be through death or family, um, you know, or people are moving away. Um, so a lot of their support system might not be available to them. Um, and then the last one that I thought was really interesting is the, the loss of community. So as we age, we always go back to that remember when. Um, you know, and even for myself, as I find myself getting older, I think, oh, remember when the park used to do this or remember when, you know, so as you get older in times, you know, there's newer people coming into town and things are changing, you know, the older community can possibly, not everyone, perceive that maybe they're not cared about as much. Um, and that one really made me stop and think um, that, you know, I can really see how that can happen. Um, so let me see here, I can move this down a little bit. So what I did is I um, tried to put together some resources that, you know, I found in Dighton. Um, can you see that? Did I move it down okay? Yes. Okay. And so please, whoever is in the room, if I am, in, you know, I, I did my best with researching um, the website on the Council on Aging. Aging. I actually spoke with Alice Souza, who is the executive director um, via telephone, and I spoke with Sheila New. Um, hopefully I'm saying her name correctly. Um, and they were very helpful. I was really hoping to be able to have someone from the Council on Aging speak at the meeting today, because I'm sure they can portray their services a lot better than I can. Um, but unfortunately, it was kind of last minute and um, uh, no one was able to. So um, whoever is in there, I'm not sure. I think Mr. Pacheco, uh, you would probably have a, a good idea. Um, but please stop me, interrupt me if I am incorrect in, in what I'm saying. Um, so most people know that the town of Dighton does have um, the community food bank. I believe from what I'm gathering that it opens on the third Saturday of the month, um, typically. Um, and it opens at 8 a.m. 
And some of the upcoming dates are August 21st, September 18th, October 16th, and November 20th. Um, and it operates from the basement level of the town hall. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and I do believe if you're new to the food bank, you have to come and present an ID um, and a utility bill and proof of uh, categorically needy. Is that correct as well? Yes, we think so. Okay. The process. Yes. Okay. Um, so we do have that. Um, as far as looking at socialization and physical um, activity, there are exercise classes, um, which I actually didn't realize um, that were going on. Now, as a result of COVID, everything has, you know, is not what it was probably a year and a half, two years ago. Um, so right now their exercise classes are being held um, at the Lions Pavilion, um, you know, whether with the weather being nice out. Um, so they have a regularly scheduled exercise class Monday at 9 a.m. Then on Wednesdays, they have a chair yoga class um, at 9 a.m. And then on Friday, um, they have a Tai Chi at 9 a.m. So basically every week, it looks like they're having a Monday, Wednesday, Friday exercise. Um, and then they do do a walking club, which is on their calendar through the Council on Aging, but I'm not sure if the Council on Aging are the ones that actually oversee it. Um, I wasn't able to get a clear picture on that, but there is a walking club in the mornings, I believe, um, that happens behind town hall. So does anybody have anything to say to those? Does that, does that sound about right for anybody who may or may not know? Um, um, Kristen, I went on the um, Diet Council of Aging group on the Diet Town page, uh, and I will, Put the link in the minutes. Um, Thank you. You're going to yeah, put it in the minutes? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the biggest resource I think that the town has to offer, and like I said, Alice and Sheila were really great in trying to, and there's so much information. I mean, we couldn't cover everything, you know, um, in, a, in a short phone call, um, but it was interesting to me, and I, I, I think that other people, you know, would find it interesting as well. Um, so the Dighton Council on Aging was established in 1973. Um, it was designed to serve all Dighton residents over the age of 60. Their mission from their website is to promote, evaluate, and encourage new and existing activities and surface, services which will enhance the quality of life of elders living in the town of Dighton. Like I mentioned, um, Alice Souza is the executive director. Um, I believe Tom Ferry is the chairman. Um, and Sheila New oversees prime time, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, I have the number posted there where they can be reached. Um, and they're available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Their location, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Pacheco, um, has been originally, it was out of Lincoln Woods is their primary office location, um, but she had recently been operating out of the primetime offices, but I believe she's going back to Lincoln Woods. I mean, yes, Lincoln, yes, Lincoln Woods, Lincoln yes. Village. <laughs> yeah, she's back at Lincoln uh, Village now. Okay, so they are back at Lincoln Village, but none of the programming or anything is really running out of Lincoln Village because that's, of... That's correct. Um, so, but she and um, her assistant, uh, Bella, I believe is also very accessible and helpful. Um, and then their website, it took me a little bit to, you know, I was hoping that I was going to be able to locate the website pretty quickly. Um, but just so people know, if you, if you were to look up their website, if you wanted to access it, you would go to the DightonMass.gov. Then you actually have to go on the government tab, and then that will take you to the Council on Aging tab. Um, so they offer, um, a variety of services. And if they can't help you, um, their goal actually is really to provide you with the resources and the contact information um, so you can get the help you need. Um, so they have a variety of services and information that they can provide you. Um, you know, that I'm here, here, there's Bristol Elder Services, which involve having a homemaker, shopping, um, housekeeping, laundry, 
There's an elder mobile outreach team, wellness clinic, podiatry clinic, vision clinic. Um, some of these things might not be with COVID going on right now, um, but they can give you information to food stamps program. Um, there's actually a program called Are You OK program, um, which I looked up and that is actually someone that actually just calls in. You can sign up as a senior and they call in on a regular basis to see how you are if you're okay and if there's anything that you need. Um, they also have information regarding the SHINE program, which is servicing the health insurance needs of everyone program. And um, if they can't answer your questions, they do refer you to, I believe it's out of um, Attleboro. But Sheila said often it's just a simple question, um, but if they can't, they will definitely point you in the right direction. Meals on Wheels, Veterans Services, and um, much more. Um, so really the list could go on and on. But one of the things that they do do, which I think is excellent, um, is they have the Strawberry Vine, which is a newsletter that they put out on a monthly basis. Um, and I'm going to share it with you all. Um, and what I really love the most about this is it, has, it's, it actually gets mailed to people's home. So, you know, as a senior, you're not surfing a website at, you know, most likely, I shouldn't, I shouldn't assume, I, I take that back. But, you know, if you have a piece of mail that's delivered directly to your house, you're most likely going to pick it up and say, hey, I'm going to look at this. Um, so this newsletter gets mailed out monthly um, to all the residents in Dayton over the age of 60. Um, Kristen, yes. um, are you showing us the newsletter? Oh, hold on, hold on. Thank you. Bear with me here. I forgot I had to change it. All right, let's try. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. So, um, thanks. So, like I was saying, so it actually is a hard copy, and I provided it to to you guys. I think you have it there in front of you. I doubt it. It's in color form. Uh, that was just a black and white copy that I gave. Um, so, and it provides you know people in the town with a wealth of information. Um, so, you know, as you go through, you know, they have the prescription talks to the donut hole, like I was referencing first about prescriptions. Um, and information that you can use. Um, and actually it was kind of appropriate because August 21st is Senior Citizens Day. Um, so couldn't be more appropriate to connect that to wellness. Um, I'm just gonna kind of scroll through here, but it's a pretty lengthy, I believe it's an eight page um, newsletter. They reference the, um, the food bank. They give some nutritional information. Um, they talk about the exercise classes. It does talk to the podiatry clinic, um, uh, which I had no idea that they ran out of prime time um, and you have to make an appointment for it. That's a great service. Um, I believe they also do a vision clinic and a wellness clinic. Um, and I'm not sure how often they do the podiatry clinic. I wasn't able to ask her that. Um, the um, transportation, which this one was a great service because I actually have a family member that lives in town over the age of 60 um, with a lot of medical issues who actually use this service. Um, and she actually had to go to Boston um, for an appointment. So it, it, this is really an excellent service for people that might not have the ability to have transportation or have someone give them a ride. Um, so it, it shares that information with the phone number. Um, emergency preparedness coming into hurricane season. Um, and then there's a nice article here on from Myrna Santos, who I don't know if they officially call her the top historian or not, but she she has a lot of um, history. Down. So there's oh, there seems to always be an article um, or a writing in here from Myrna. Um, hold on guys, Let's see here. It's um, it veterans information, how to report um, elder abuse. Um, and then the other thing that I thought was really neat and I had no idea is that you seniors can buy single trash bags. So if you're a senior living by yourself, you're most likely not generating as much trash as somebody that you know has a family of four, five, six or what have you. Um, so they're actually able to buy one trash bag at a time or you know or what have you so they're not having to spend the full cost of twenty dollars for this bag of groceries that they might not ever use 
Um, and I believe that can be purchased at the primetime location too. So, um, and then they, she puts in this um, nice little calendar here with the activities and what's going on and different theme days. Um, so, and then um, on the last page, it does just reference the services that they offer um, that connect with their members um, and what have you. So I think it's just a really great resource that they, that the offers in the town. Um, and I just love the idea that it's a paper copy because to be honest with you, I am a paper and pen person myself. So, uh, and then the last thing that I just wanted to talk to, I'm just gonna go back to this screen here, um, is prime time. Um, and for some people that maybe are new to town, um, I'm not sure, you know, if they know of it. Unfortunately, due to COVID, um, it has not been operating right now. Um, but Primetime is an adult uh, supportive program. It was established in 1994. It operated out of the lower level of town hall. Um, and then it moved to the building behind um, the town hall you're in now in 2001. It is funded by special grants trust awards, donations, and private payment. Um, it strives to provide a home-like environment, promote independence, socialization, maintain mobility, and maximize health. Uh, they offer a hot breakfast, a hot lunch, and a snack. Um, they have also been the recipient of what they call the Rose Award in 1998 and 2002, which is resources organized to serve elders. Um, daily activities they do fitness spiritual sports arts and crafts weekly activities including hairdressing bowling league crossword puzzles discussion group monthly is the blood pressure screening podiatry monthly excursions birthday celebrations um so you know and it is such a, a wonderful program i've known people that have been a, in the program um, you know, and hopefully, you know, with, with this Delta variant, everything right now, things are at a standstill. Um, but, you know, hopefully the program will be able to get back up and running. Um, you know, I, I think for me, you know, a lot of these things, these barriers that we talk about, we're all not going to be able to fix them today. But as a community member, I think of, you know, being neighborly and just taking that extra minute to think about the elderly or the your person, whether it be get their newspaper or their mail, um, you know, run an errand for them, put in their air conditioner in these hot days, um, making sure, you know, that they have what they need, or even just a friendly check-in. Um, because sometimes I think that, you know, we as a community in the world, we often forget, you know, forget about the seniors and the, el the elderly people that might need that. And a lot of people aren't going to reach out and they're not going to ask for help because, they're, you know, they're, they're not going to do that. Um, so if I'm missing anything that Dighton also offers, please, I would love to hear about it. Um, I know that we do have some homebound seniors in town, I believe, and they were doing vaccinations in the homes, if I'm correct for, was that right? We were working with that? Yeah, it's a state thing now that they can do vaccinations within the home. I think most of it is sign up online. So again, if they don't have access to technology, it's going to be a lot more challenging for them. So just you know, be aware of your neighbor and, and see how you can help out, like you had said. And right. So I know that was kind of lengthy and a lot of information, but you know, it's really a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, and this is what I do. Um, so, but again, I think just, you know, what we can do to help them maintain as much independence, dignity, wellness, and, and to try to continue to reach the goals that, that they want to re reach and what's important to them, um, in their life. And, and remember that they were, you know, part of the community way back when, and, you know, what that, that, that morning of what community was to them. So that's it. Does anybody have any questions or can I try to answer anything or... I think you did a great job. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have um, Jonathan Gallup is here. He um, is the chair, correct, of the um, Veteran Committee of Disability. I, I know I'm 
totally messing that up. So That's okay, feel free to mess up. <laughs> you can, you can uh, okay. acknowledge yourself. I will. Christian, if, 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 if anybody could not hear me on Zoom, feel free to, to let me know. I will move. So, um, my name is Jonathan Dale, and I am the chairperson of the Dighton Commission on Disability. I'm also the ADA coordinator for the town of Dighton. I have been a resident of Dighton for almost five years. Um, I am one of the seniors that you folks are speaking of this evening, in, in my own right as well. Uh, we are raising two grandkids in the town of Dighton. I also have a disability as a person and as a senior in that I am totally blind with zero vision and have been for approximately 33 years. So you're talking about the human condition this evening and you're talking about seniors and Kristen was, and you, and you as well, were just talking, for example, about uh, vaccinations and so forth. So one of the things that we take into account very carefully as the ADA uh, coordinator for people with disabilities and the commission on disability is how we serve the residents in our town who have different types of condition. That can be seniors and very often more so are older quote unquote people, but it may not be people who are older as well. So as an example, when we were talking about the vaccinations, as I said, one of the things that we provide was direct service and resource for people to get vaccinated and arrange transportation. So we directly set up and coordinated because they are seniors or because they have disability and or because they couldn't use technology, we arranged for 18 Dighton residents, 16 of whom were directly identified as seniors, some of those also having multi-disabilities and homebound, not only to arrange for the vaccination, but for transportation to vaccination. We were also able to arrange in four, four separate cases for homebound residents to have someone come to the home and do that through the, through the Commonwealth by doing the information that we needed to be on the website and contacting the Commonwealth directly. So that's an example of what the ADA, ADA Commission has been able to do on behalf of the human element, if you will, for people with disability and for seniors. One of the things that, Kristen, you talked about, you, you and I couldn't hear each other putting some of this together. <laughs> so we talked about earlier, I was listening to the conversation about transportation, for example, and, the human, and I consider all these part of the human condition for seniors. What people should think about too, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of numbers to work with here, so you can see a, kind of a little bit of a formula. The average senior is living on just over a thousand, one thousand dollars $1,000 per month. You know, some of us may get relatively decent and comfortable pensions, but a lot of seniors are just living on social security or social security disability or the equivalent of. So it's, it's roughly, it's a little over a thousand dollars a month for that particular type of senior. And if you think of a senior also having to contribute, even though it's a small amount for transportation, for medical service and resources and so forth, if it's, for example, five dollars a ride, but they have to go to the doctors three times a month. That's a round trip, that's six trips. And if they have to go to the supermarket and buy groceries, you know, three times a month or, or whatever, there's another six trips. What I'm getting at is a senior on $1,000 a month can very easily get 10% of their income for $100 for just transportation alone, just to survive. Let alone be able to, as was alluded to earlier, be able to buy foods that are nourishing and have the vitamins and nutrients they need. So, first of all, the food pantry is very important, not only for all residents in town, but for seniors in town as well. Transportation, as I just said, is extremely important because, you know, if you make $50,000, you know, $100 is nothing in that, in that big scheme, but if you make $1,000, you know, or, or 12000 a year and you're spending 1200 there's 10% of your income just to survive. Another aspect is housing. So I also serve on the 40B committee in town. And one of the things that we're looking at, which is the fair housing committee, every town ultimately has to hit a goal of 10% of low income slash subsidized affordable housing. That can be Lincoln Village. It can be 40B housing development. It can be a condo association. There's a whole different scheme of ways to get that 10%. Right now, for example, Dighton is going at roughly a little over four percent. Now, as the town grows, the population is not actually about seven thousand; it's almost eighty-two hundred. As the population grows, that percentage goes down. So, one of the things that we look at are ways 
to increase subsidized and affordable housing in Titan with a focus going to the future on people who are longtime residents and seniors in town, because many of these seniors can no longer afford to live where they live. They can't get around the home because it's got two or three floors. They can't do the maintenance because of the medical condition. There are so many factors that enter into this, but what we want to do is be able to let these same seniors, and they should have the right to have the dignity and respect to live, grow old, and frankly, pass away in their home community. In order to do that, we have to create affordable housing units within the community. That means low income, low income to moderate, affordable units, perhaps rental, rental and through the low income rental system, perhaps other ways that people can purchase through the low income home ownership program. But the goal would be to keep people in the community. So as we look at 40 new projects in the future, we look at that as well. When we look at the medical needs of of people within the community. We look at, you know, you can't get there from here. And I hate to sound like that fact, because we all know it's kind of surrounded by cities, but it doesn't have a lot of resources in town. People have medical needs and transportation needs. They can get to other towns to some extent through the transportation network. So one of the things that I, I worked on in the past was sitting on the governor's commission, which is called the five, what was called the 530 commission. And what we were looking at was ways to put a seamless transportation system together for seniors and people with disability in the Commonwealth together. So that you can get, if you have to go to Boston, you can easily get from here to there without potentially having to do transfers or wait two hours and sit outside somewhere for a ride to pick you up if you're in a wheelchair or you're holding a white cane or a walker and there's no seats or the doors are locked and it's freezing in the winter. So, you know, a lot of times these folks have medical needs on weekends. They can't get there because these transportation companies, unless it's an emergency, do not cover programs and transportation procedures on weekends. This is part of what a seamless system would do. So that's something that we're working on as well. Um, with regard to other types of services, we're looking at town at, at ways, for example, the room we're in right now. If you look at the stage, you'll see that if, if you face the stage, there's no access for a person who has to use a wheelchair or a walker or may have other types of disability that make it impossible for them to step up and get to that stage. We've just submitted a variance to the State of Protections Access Board so that we can create a ramp with the right angle, the right distance, and the right transition point for a wheelchair so that a person with a disability, including senior, keep that in mind again, can go to the stage, <laughs> make a statement, share their thoughts with the rest of the community, and be given full access. We're looking at doing the same thing for parks in town so that seniors can go to a park with their children, their grandchildren, with their friends, or that they have a walker or a wheelchair or other mobility device, and they can comfortably and safely and easily go up to one of the picnic tables and share time, share, share conversations, share meals, things like that. Parking access in town, we're looking at that. Looking at the schools so that whether you're a child or an adult who has a disability, we can get you safely into the school and you can be fully participatory, whether it's the ramps outside, the sidewalks, roadways access, those are things we're looking at as well. Many seniors have difficulty going to a meeting being able to hear. So we're looking at ways to mitigate, even if it's in a meeting in this room anywhere, if a senior wants to come or a person with a disability wants to come, if they need cart services, which is using the big screen and putting everything in written format in effect, similar to um, to, to, to a person doing ston stenography, or if a person needs other types of services, hearing aid services, or hearing enhanced services for seniors, things like that. So I'm kind of crossing the lines back and forth between seniors and people with disability, but a lot of, a lot of those focuses are very, very much the same. So our goal as a commission on disability, and for me personally, is to look at the overall human condition. And that means it doesn't matter if the person is a minority, regardless of the religion, regardless of the color. When you have a disability or a limitation for a senior, you have every right to be treated fully, 100% equally, respect, respect, respect. That's the way it should be. That's that's what we all expect. You alluded earlier to the United Nations and to their, part of what you're saying is, is correct in terms of their charter and mandate, but for example, one of the things that the UN has had a lot of countries, including the US, by the way, it, it just recently passed the human rights condition for persons with disabilities. That's less than two years old in the UN. We shouldn't have to fight for rights for seniors and people with disability 
and have so many countries who still haven't even signed on to it. You know, people with disability, people with seniors, I will kind of close on this. People with disability and people with seniors are our most vulnerable populations. And it's up to all of us, regardless of whether you're older like myself and perhaps others in the room, or you're much younger like others of you in the room. If the Human Rights Committee in town is doing what I think part of what you should be doing is having, not just having a conversation about what you can do in terms of the wellness and well-being of seniors and potentially people with disability, but it's finding ways to execute processes that actually encourage that throughout the town. So, you know, the vast majority of the town, except for those of us in the room who are on Zoom here tonight, thankfully, we're here because we're, we're putting this first, we're putting these types of conditions first. But it, it's the responsibility of all of us to find ways to reach out. And, you know, you're looking at the human kindness, you're looking at the human condition, you're looking at the person, and you're seeing what they can do and what they can't do. What are they capable of? What do they need help with? How can we support them? You, you know, we're just in the process in the town of beginning to put together a registry for people who are seniors and have disability. So that if there is a flood, if there is an emergency, if there is a hurricane, we have ways, ways to reach out to these folks, to evacuate them, to go to their homes and see for the shutters, what can we provide for you? Can we take you out of here? Can we contact family members? Most of these folks don't have that ability. They don't know how to use technology. They're afraid of the technology. They're afraid of new things happening in their lives. You know, in many cases, as they get older and older and older, they're, they're, they're dealing with certain forms of dementia as well. You know, that plays a lot into it. And there are a lot of families who've lived in this community all of their lives, their children, their grandchildren are still here. And I think we have to find ways to also educate and call on those other members of the family, the children, the grandchildren, to resource what they have in terms of providing assistance and services to folks as well. So I'll leave it with this a little bit. I was having a conversation last night with some folks who were visiting our home from the West Coast. And we were talking about specifically what what is different? What do I think people can do to some extent in terms of the human condition and human kindness and sharing um, and recognizing the equality and the equity that, that all of us have to work and deal with? And I was kind of joking and half not joking. Remember, I, just, I began by saying I'm totally blind. And I'm going to suggest it would be interesting in the town to have a day, and I know you talked about this and thought about this a little bit, where you focus on wellness and that throughout the community. And one of the things that would be interesting would be to have residents who were willing try to put on what are called occluders, and in fact they were blindfolds, and meet other people within the community, whether you're a senior, whether you're a young person, whether you're a person with a disability. If you have the occluder on, you see what I see, which is nothing. And, but what you see differently is a little bit of a person's soul. And when you do that, you have a different attitude and a different approach about the people you meet and what comes out of their mouth and what doesn't. You're not judging a person based on they look old, quote unquote, or they look this, or they look that, or they wear a burqa, or whatever it might be. You're judging a person strictly on what comes out of their mouth and how you engage them. And you engage them the same, but your perception is different. So I'm going to leave that thought there as something you might want to consider when you do a day of wellness in the community that I know you spoke of. But in terms, in terms of seniors and people with disability, I do think the Human Rights Committee has a responsibility to some extent to find ways to make sure that people that we're talking about this evening have the ability to be engaged this evening. You know, the seniors who might want to be engaged aren't able to use Zoom. They don't know how to, or they may not even be able to afford the technology. So, you know, COVID yes, COVID no, what are some of the ways you folks potentially reach out to seniors other ways? Um, whether that's putting something in this strawberry newsletter and inviting people of senior who are seniors to come here, if that means they need transportation, can you arrange it? Can you, can you do it yourselves? Are there other ways that they can be set up beyond Zoom, which is a, you know, a, a link that they can't do on their phone if they don't know how to use a smartphone even. Are there other ways you can engage them indirectly? So um, that's pretty much all I have to say right now. If anybody has any questions about who I am or what we do, I'm happy to entertain it now or after we close out the meeting, whichever it is. But thank you for inviting me and I'm looking forward to participating further. Who knows, I might be a member here pretty soon. <laughs>
Just saying. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, should we allow um, if anybody from the public has any questions? I think that's a good idea, um, especially now that we have our guest speaker here, um, Mr. Gale. So I think Jill, that's a great idea. If anyone in the public does want to contribute to um, Mr. Gale's comments, um, or any of the other presenters, we just ask that you um, unmute rather than using the chat box because that's um, more difficult to follow. I have a quick question. I was just curious, you know, so, you know, I appreciate all the information um, that you're offering and, um, you know, definitely something that I would want to be a part of. Um, how closely do you work with the Council on Aging in town? The answer, the answer to your question is the Commission on Disability as a commission was informed, uh, was formed in September, our first meeting was in November. And as the ATA coordinator for the town, I have officially been doing this for roughly about a year now. Um, and it took time to get up and get going. So we're just at the point now, Alice and I have spoken. We did uh, have a conversation around some of the issues related to COVID and vaccination and so forth with other departments in town as well. I'm also a part of the, as the coordinator, part of the emergency preparedness team in town and um, a few of the other things in town as well. Um, so. We're just beginning to have, be able to have a conversation because in order for us to get up and running, there were certain mandates the state required us to do first in terms of bylaws, in terms of a few other things. What we have done, where Alice was also included, was we um, had an outside consultant come in and do a study of a lot of the buildings and grounds within our town and how that affects people with disability and seniors. So Alice was a part of that. And as I said, we worked together on some of the COVID related issues. So we're just beginning to be able to sit down and coordinate. Great. I actually, when I spoke with her, I asked, you know, if at this point, if there's any volunteers that, you know, could be, you know, could they use volunteers? What type of things could community members do to volunteer time to help? Um, but unfortunately, she said at this point, she felt as though there really wasn't a space for that. And I think until we get through whatever's happening with COVID and kind of what direction they're going. <laughs> I think that I'll, I'll answer that for, I'll give you a general answer to that. And I think um, Mr. Pacheco is a member of the Board of Stuck and can allude to this too, but what I've, what I've learned as well from, through the work I've done for the town and the regular work that I do, um, I'm a disabilities consultant by trade or and a lobbyist, but what, what happens is when people want to volunteer, they have to go through background checks, they have to go through quarry checks, they may have to go through finger back checks. There's a number of things they have to go through. So, you know, it would be wonderful to say, I want to volunteer, but when the person does want to volunteer and it's in something that's something that's connected officially to the town, there is a, a legal process they have to go through in order to, to make sure that that person meets a certain standard, if you will. Well, I definitely think though that wouldn't be a reason to want to shoot something that like that down because I certainly wouldn't have any problem volunteering my time and going through those steps. So, um, you know, I, I, I think, and I, and I think, I think, you know, one of the things that I think we want to look at as a, as a disabilities commission and work with some of the other folks in town, including Alice, is how we can potentially strengthen the volunteer core for the community overall. Because there are, there are different organizations in town that could provide volunteer resource services, whether it's something from the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, right. or, you know, Lions Club, for example, provides a lot, a lot of volunteerism. Right. The types of things in town. There are other organizations that may be able to step up as well, but I think that's it's a process, and right now, unfortunately, COVID is in the way of that. Right. Absolutely. Well, thank you for all your information. You're welcome. Uh, we do have a question from the audience and the other members who are participating via Zoom. Um, however, as Jill mentioned before, it is harder to see the chat. Um, and um, I'm sure, you know, as Mr. Gale mentioned earlier today, um, he is blind. Um, so Tom Bellucci, you have a question. Can you unmute yourself and ask the question? 
um, that you specifically asked? Can you hear me okay? We can. Beautiful, thank you. Um, my question is, how do we pay for all this? Aren't we already uh, paying a considerable amount of our paychecks every week for this kind of thing? I mean, I can I can generally tell you that a W-2 employee is losing about 40% of his or her paycheck every week to uh, support some kind of government program. And it's you know, it sounds good. It feels good to, you know, help the less fortunate and so forth. But, you know, there, there comes a point where it becomes too much. And over the last four to five years, I think the property tax on my house has nearly doubled. So at what point does the burden on the taxpayer become too much? And uh, thank you. I'll uh, mute myself again. Sir, um, this is Mr. Gale. I'm going to give you... I can't speak for the town and for their overall budget, um, nor, nor am I going to try. What I will say to you is that there are certain responsibilities, whether any of us or all of us agree or disagree, that we're mandated to have by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and by the federal government, regardless of which party you're in, regardless of how you feel about certain types of representation, you know, conservative, you know, liberal, whatever it might be. So, for example, and I'm going to focus on what I talked about earlier, the Mass in Massachusetts and federally under the ADA Act, which just turned 31 years old, there's a responsibility to address certain needs of an individual town for ramps, for sidewalks, um, for people with disability to have access to all public resources. Public resources doesn't just mean a ramp in a building, which unfortunately or fortunately, you know, it costs money to build those ramps, to go to the library, go to town hall, so that they can pay their bill or ask a question. It costs money to provide interpretive services for a person who is in hearing impaired, whether it's sign language or card services. It costs money to, you know, uh, rent, you know, wheelchairs if you have a public event at a, at a public school so that people with disability come, you have them at the door. The problem you have is that if you if you don't provide these these types of services to people with disability and seniors, then you're not you're not making the, the you're, there's less of a fair share system. In other words, it affects the equity of people who can come out and participate. And I use the simple town meeting method. If you don't have these things available to people who have disability, then you're in that you're not enabling that person with disability to potentially share in town meeting, make your voices heard, vote, et cetera. Those folks, very often, they are or were significant contributing, contributing members who are taxpayers. They still pay property tax in many cases. They still receive retirement income or disability income in many cases. And in many cases, they still work and they earn a paycheck. And unfortunately, People with disabilities separately often have lower paychecks because they're hired based on their disability, not their ability. I just thought I'd throw that in there. But what it means is we're all responsible for making sure that the equity train keeps on going, whether we agree with it or disagree with it, certainly back to how it started in the beginning. And personally, I think that that's a challenge that we all have to face all the time. So. You, you know, you mentioned taxes, for example. We just got a grant that I was I was partially responsible for writing for almost $120,000. That grant for the town is going to make several intersections, including some right out here, fully accessible for people with disability. It also makes it accessible for people, children on bicycles. It also makes the ramp street crossing accessible for a, a person who might be willing to baby carriage. So, some of what we do and the work that we do that we that we do goes way beyond people with disability. I understand what you're what you're saying. I hear you completely. I respect what you have to say. But whether we agree or disagree, in some cases, we are bound by statute to do what we have to do. And that's a long answer. I apologize. Uh, I appreciate the long answer. I also want to let you know that uh, Tom does want to um, mention something else. Tom, I think you are unmuted if you want to give a shout out. Yeah, you'll have to forgive me with the uh, technology and so forth. I'm still kind of a Luddite. But um, uh, so 
we have to follow back where where grant money comes from and so forth and we have to follow the the source of money um the source of money is not government government does not create wealth government does not come up with grant money government redistributes money that people have earned and in you know in the course of private business uh, government can only extract money from its constituents it cannot create wealth so while i i think that helping the disabled is extremely laudable as the parent of two children with autism i'll i'll be the first one to tell you that and i apologize you can probably hear one of them yelling in the background right now um while it's laudable and it's uh certainly a wonderful thing there, there does come a limit as to how much we can afford so as a town i don't think we should bite off more than we can chew at any one time it should be a, a kind of easing into the bath water rather than just jumping right in but thank you for your time. I do appreciate it. I'm, I'm going to mute myself now. I'm just going to respond to tell you, thank you for your response. Thank you for your, your comment as well. Um, I, I, I don't think that this is the time or place for me to, to, to take the conversation further. I'd be happy to have it with you offline if you would like. Um, but having said that, I think, you know, my responsibility is to ensure that, as I said, people with disability as much as the town can do, have the ability and, and the resource there to do it with. And I hear what you're saying about even that money has to come from somewhere else and so forth. You're absolutely right about that to some extent. But for better or worse, we have responsibilities and obligation. And that's part of why I'm here and why I do what I do, which is to, to enhance those responsibilities and the obligation of the town, clearly doing it in the best interest of the town and the residents. So thank you for your comment. I appreciate it. So just for the interest of time, um, I know that it's getting a little late, so I would like to move on. Um, and if anybody has any further questions, they can ask them during the open discussion and public input. Um, so the next part is activities around writing for various populations. I know that we touched a lot on that during um, the previous discussion. So I just wanted to share a list of um, different activities that were found that are um, within either the state of Massachusetts or um, some in Rhode Island that are um, either free for families or um, you know there is some cost associated with some of the ends. So this is um, the Highland Street um, Foundation and they do, it used to be free fun Fridays that they would do every summer and they would go and you could they have a list of things that you could do on Fridays um, for your families. For those, the people that just, you know, either you can't afford it or, you know, you just need a little bit of break. I think we could all use a little bit of a, of a break on, on paying for everything now and then. So just a way to get out and, um, you know, get the kids out of the house. They, you know, they, they lost a lot during COVID with the socialization aspect of it. And that is also part of our wellness is our mental health. Um, so these are some activities that you can do with your kids. So rather than doing a free fun Friday, they decided to do um, different activities every day of the month. So this was um, their monthly schedule. So, and I, again, we just wanted to share this so that they are in on the, the, the Zoom and, and for YouTube so people can go back and read late. Um, so these are also some free activities, um, just some like different ideas. Um, so there's so many parks around Dighton. Um, we actually have an activity that um, Kristen was able to create to sponsor a kids yoga. And that's going to be on August 28th at 930 in the morning. And it's going to be with a certified child um, yoga instructor. And we just ask that if anybody can participate, we um, ask that you can just bring a, a a non-perishable food item for the food bank. Um, again, so that's going to be on August 28th at 9.30, and that's for kids yoga at Tricentennial Park. Um, we have Dighton, I'm not going to read them all because they're all here, but we have the Dighton Historical Museum is up there um, because that's my, my kids' favorite place to go. Um, and I just think it's a really fun um, thing we have. Pure Speech has different concerts during um, the summer. They have different things to do. They just opened up their 
old the slide that is up there. Um, so those are some, these are also free options. So um, that's a picture of Fort Adams, which is in um, Newport. And you can walk around the grounds if you want to go in. You can do a self-guided tour, which is free. You can do um, a guided tour and that's for a low cost. Um, Fort Phoenix, you can do the New Bedford Boardwalk where you can go. And there's wells up there all the time that you can see. And you just walk and you can ride your bikes. Um, the Avila Earl Art Museum, a lot of people don't realize that you can go for free. Um, World War II Memorial. Um, Blue Hills has a ton of different trail parks. That's okay, you can go on. Um, sorry, I'm trying to see from a distance. Um, PVD Fest, which is right outside of the Providence um, Place Mall, and it's a bunch of different vendors. They always have different concerts. You can Google it and um, you can see like all the different People only have a lot of school of rock will come in and so the kids are performing and they're amazing. Um, Call State Park, which is always a kid's favorite as well, bring your bikes. Um, Slater Park, which is in Pawtucket, they have a whole schedule of activities and events that you can do. So Tojan Puppet Band is going, they have um, some like a playground area, uh, Rocky Point State Park, which I think we all remember from our youth, you can go, and that's one of the pictures from there. Um, but in the park, you can, you're not supposed to keep the swans, so don't do that, but it's just a fun place. Um, the Cape Cod Canal, everybody loves that. Freedom Trail, I've been lots of you can do some history while you're walking. Um, and then these are some of the places that you can go that you know, there may be a fee. Um, most of them are fairly nominal, but um, I would research it just to make sure that you can um, go. There's also the, the library, the public library has um, tickets that you can get. Sometimes they're for free tickets for your family, or sometimes it's just for a reduced cost. So I would definitely check in with them there. They do have a limited number, but you can reserve what you want to do. So they have some New England Aquarium, they have Mystic Aquarium different things. Um, there's a Fenway Park tour that is, is fairly reasonable and you get to go all behind the scenes and you get to listen um, to people. Sometimes you get to see them outside like you know doing batting practice or you know, throwing. So so that's just a very quick um, there's so many activities. We live in a great area. I think we forget because you know, Diana is so small and, and it seems like there's not a lot to do, but there really are so many different options. We, are, we can go pretty much anywhere and see different things. We can go to Boston and see all the history there and do like the Tea Party Museum. We can go down to the Cape and watch whales or right now you can you know, see sharks. Um, there's places in Rhode Island that you can go and like, see the seals. Um, so just to get families out there, go hiking. Um, do some geocaching if that's something that you're really invested in. You know, it's just something fun to do. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that we covered something along those lines. Does anybody have any um, other activities that they're aware of that I may not be aware of? I know that the library is doing pop-up libraries throughout the town. Um, Wednesdays are in North Dighton by the ball field. Um, and then they do different locations throughout the week. I'm not exactly sure where else, but um, that's an option. Um, I think you really enjoy that. And then they're doing the um, PTO day for kids to come back to, like the before the school be you know, begins, they do like a library at the park. Just again, we just want to make sure everybody's getting out. It, it's not only good for the, for the kids' mental health, but it's good for us parents' and mental health because get some of their energy out, we can go and, and just take a walk and breathe and, and feel nature. You know, so, for, um, so the calendar that you showed, so were those events all free on those days? According to the website, yes. So on those days, the, in, I know that you have um, gone and done the free fun Fridays in the past. But, um, so that is replacing that. So before it would be, I think, like five to 10 options on each Friday. So most of them were not close by. So this just kind of breaks it up. I think it's so that um, there's more access to different places. Different areas. Yeah, that's great. 
And then the website's at the bottom. So if you want to look it up, you can do that as well. So we can move on to open discussion and public input. Could I just start? The, yeah. At the, uh, the last board of selection meeting, it was mentioned that this should not be a commission, it has to be a committee that the state authorizes commission, so we're now the uh, human rights committee, not commission. So the state um, does the commission because they back them, correct? And because we're I, I guess we volunteers have, sorry, and... Yeah, the Disability Commission is, I believe, state-mandated. Exactly. Yeah, we are mandated as a, com as a commission in any town. Um, there are certain mandates you have to follow in the state. There are certain bylaw commission you have to meet for their state. There are certain reporting commission you have to meet for the state as well. If you are a committee, you can be a committee of volunteers. You can be a commission of volunteers as well, but the mandates are different. So with that, we still have to follow the open meeting laws, everything like that. Um, yes. And the quorum. And yeah, I'm just stating it. <laughs> so I brought up a lot on that. So. <laughs> So are we now officially the Dighton Committee for Human Rights? Do we have the option to say the Dighton Human Rights Committee? You can say the Human Rights Committee, that's Human fine. Rights yeah. Committee, yeah. right? Kind of roll up the tongue a little bit easier. Yes, I was yeah. expecting the same okay. thing. <laughs> um, do we need to vote on that or that no. is true? Okay. Um, so the Dighton Commission for Human Rights will now be titled the Dighton Human Rights Committee. Yep. All right. So this is part of um, open discussion and public input, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. So does anybody have anything else? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. You know, part of public input. I thought this was a great uh, committee tonight. A lot of a lot of information. I guess my question for wellness is. Uh, so for a while, it looked like COVID was going down. People were getting out, no masks. And all of a sudden, we're doing about face. Is it me or is it a lot of people? Because I feel like your psyche is getting screwed up again. Like you've been like 16 months down, and now we're reverting back. So you don't know, is it safe to go out to a crowd? Is it safe to go to a concert? Or do you just still stay at home and stay in your backyard? Yeah. Yeah, I just find it hard to deal with. I don't know how you guys feel. I just feel it very hard dealing with that right now. I agree. I never know if I'm like, you know, I walk into a place and I'm like, should I be masked? Like, do I not be masked? Yeah, yeah. I agree. It's yeah. very hard right now. It's, it's confusing, and I think it's okay to feel confused and almost burned out from all of it because it's constantly changing. We all are here at an extremely traumatic event where, you know, the whole world is pretty much shut down. You know, there were, you know, facts being thrown out, there was money being thrown out, it was just a chaotic time. And, you know, it's going to take a while for us all to recover. And we're just history in the making right now. So I think at this point, it's important for us to do what we feel comfortable with. Whether it's getting vaccinated, not getting vaccinated, wearing the mask, not wearing the mask, staying home. But again, everything has consequences. So I think, as Vinny was saying, kind of wrap it all up, you know, you are responsible for your family, for your community, for your state, for your, you know, your country, your continent, everything like that. But it's not easy, and you're not alone. And I think to remember to not judge people by the choices that they make. Um, you know, everybody is. And nobody here has been through something like this before, so we're we're all just doing the best that we can, and you know we're 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 winging it just like everybody else. Um, and you know you listen to doctors and specialists, and you know there's some conflicting information out there. So I feel like I feel like we just have to make sure that we're cutting people breaks. Um, I think there's also a fight from the last Jackson. That's right. I think there's a lot of fear on both sides of the equation. There's fear of people who haven't gotten vaccinated as to whether they should or not, and why they should or shouldn't trust it, and whether or not it's quote approved, unquote, or not. There's fear of people who have been vaccinated, whether they're with somebody who really hasn't or has been vaccinated, are they telling the truth or not? There's fear of people whether or not we're going to ultimately find out that we have to have a booster and how many it's going to be every year, every two years. There's fear that. You know, the Delta variance is going to become Delta 2, Delta 3, Delta 4. 
and how far down it's going to go and so forth. And I think what I personally, I think what people need to do is you need to err on the side of responsibility. And the responsibility is, you know, we have a feeling of what we think is right or wrong, but I think we also have the responsibility that we have regardless of this is, how does what I do, regardless of what my political belief is, potentially affect others? And that's really, to me, the question that people have to ask themselves. I have two grandkids, as I said earlier, that we're raising who are going to the high school next year. Well, the state didn't mandate masking yet for high schoolers. What they said is it's going to be up to the districts to determine, to some extent, how they're going to handle that in high schools. How is that going to affect sports again? How is that going to affect what type of learning they do? Or theater groups that they're in, for example, you know? Or um, it doesn't matter what. Are we going to potentially have to go back to a hybrid form of learning? You know, or is it going to be strictly online at some point again? I think there's so many unknowns here. That again, regardless of where you stand, none of us have answers to. But what I just said is that I, I, again, I think we have to always be responsible and conscious of the decisions we make and how they potentially affect others. Right, and you know, with with children under the age of twelve, they can't get the vaccine. No. So you know, just to be mindful of of that as well, because these are our this is our future, and they're walking around and they're very susceptible. I know that. You know, they're, they don't get hit with it the same way mm -hmm. for most, um, but, you know, we don't, we don't know what their abilities are, you know, medically, so we just have to make sure that we're always You know, it's, one last thing I just want to add, it's also important to understand that in some cases, for example, if a person isn't vaccinated in some cases, it's not necessarily because they automatically don't want to be. Mm -hmm. I know a few situations, partly because of the work that I've done at the time and, and otherwise, there are some residents who are not vaccinated because their doctors are advised against it. And their doctors are advised against it because of their own medical condition and the medications they have to take and how it can be contrary to what the vaccinations, the vaccines have in them. So, you know, there's never a one size fits all, is what I'm saying in that, in that last comment. So the COVID numbers have been going up and down. Only 51% of us are vaccinated. Um, this past week, uh, we had three, the week before it was four, the week before that was five, but before that, about five weeks, there was zero new cases. So the numbers are starting to go up, and because we're going to stop being inside more as the weather gets cold and everything else, I can see the, the numbers uh, going up again. Not as bad, hopefully, as it was in the past, but 51% of vaccines. Understanding that 11 and under can't get vaccinated, and it's quite popular. That's a good part of our population. But so we wear a mask when we go into a supermarket or into a store. Uh, we don't necessarily wear it when we go into a restaurant. We can go inside now versus uh, eating outside. But it's a personal uh, decision. But you've been advised that if you're having a vaccine, you should be wearing a mask. And I don't see too, too many masks out there, so. You do it in, uh, in solidarity in my house. Yeah. So the kids have to wear masks, we wear masks. Yeah. And that's, yeah. how, that's how we have chosen to do it. But everything is different again. And, and Okay. Is there any other public um, input or discussion, questions, thoughts? Are you ready to move on to schedule the next meeting? Sure. Um, so the next meeting would be September 7th. Um, I I know that's right after Labor Day and it's the day before I think the kids go back to school. Is there an option for everybody if we um, push that date to maybe the, like either the week after, I have to check with Leanne to make sure what's available. Um, so I'm just throwing it out there. If everybody prefers to do the seventh and, and to work out, I just know some of us with kiddos might be home the day before they start school. I would rather do the following week and that's available for everybody else. So I would make big do if I do. Yeah. So is it okay? I will contact the and see some available date options and then I will contact you each individually. Um, and you can give me what your availability is and then we will um, put that out there. Um, are you also going to ask about in-person hybrid? Strictly Zoom 
or is this what it's going to like moving forward? I think the push from the government is to have it more in person. Um, I think it depends. I don't want to make that judgment right now because we don't know what the numbers are going to look like. There is, there is, um, the governor's office has some about a month ago, and the new guidelines, and I can forward them to you if you would like, has still allowed the option um, for public public meeting law to hold meetings via Zoom and in person. So you can do a combination of a hybrid version. Okay. And that's through, I believe, next April. Mr. Chief, are you going to that first? It's April, yep. So, so we'll probably do that then. I definitely just want to be aware of like where our COVID numbers are. So, um, I, I'll, 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 I will forward that to you. Thank you. Like um, so the next meeting is going to be on um, September is Suicide Awareness Month. So we will be um, talking about that. So if anybody from the community has anything that they would like to um, you know, share or if they have any input that they would like us to have, they can email us. Um, email is um, hrc at dayton dash mn dot gov. Okay, that's right there. And it's human rights committee. So yes. Let's talk about does anybody have anything else before we have a motion to adjourn? Does anybody I want to motion? Day 16, and I make a motion to adjourn the meeting. So I'll make the motion. Second. Any executives, we have to go through roll call. Um, Kristen? Yes. Kristen? Yes. Allie? Yes. Pinion? Yes. And Jill says yes. So meeting is adjourned at 8.16. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, you did it all. I just, uh, it was a great meeting. I enjoyed it. Thank you, John, and we appreciate you coming. Absolutely.